let's take a look at journal entries in general. We're going to start by looking at the general journal. And the reason that we're going to do this is because theoretically every single transaction and every single item that we put into the books could be brought in through a general journal. So we've spoken already about the fact that every single transaction has to be journalized before being posted to the general ledger. And that means we have to be able to identify the debits and credits for every single transaction. So as an accountant, as you learn to do this, you'll start thinking in debits and credits. When someone talks to you about buying something or selling something or doing something, anything financial, you need to think about this in debits and credits. Theoretically, as I said, every single transaction can be journalized using the general journal. So let's take a look at what this thing looks like. Your general journal entries look something like this. We have a column obviously for our date to indicate the date that the transaction took place. Our details, we have the account that's going to be debited and the account that's going to be credited. Notice that we literally just tab the credit account in a little bit. So wherever we start writing the debit, we leave a little bit of space before we write the credit. And all the way through the rest of your studies, you'll always find you can see the debits and credits by, by seeing that someone drew something close to the margin as a debit and they drew it, started working further away from the margin and it's a credit. So that's something that, that we'll get used to. The narration is the description of what the transaction is. So we indicate what's going to be debited, we indicate what's going to be credited, and then we indicate what it is that the transaction is. The folio is for posting to keep referencing back and forth, and then obviously your debit amount and your credit amount. If you think about what we did in our general ledger, you can kind of feel like this sort of mirrors what we did in the general ledger. The general ledger created two accounts, debited the one and credited the other. Whereas here we take one transaction together and we show exactly how it's going to affect the basic accounting equation, the elements of the financial statements in one. So if you think about it, the general journal allows us to show the debits and credits for each transaction by the transaction together. So at one transaction, I can see the debits and credits together. Whereas in the general ledger, the debit and credit for that transaction is going to be split up. So let's take a look at an example quickly. On the 3rd of August, you purchased a vehicle from Ace Dealers for the business for 86,000 Rand and you paid out of the bank account. Your general journal would look like this. Your date, the 3rd of August, you debit the vehicle and you credit bank. Again, notice how we identify the debit and the credit. And your transaction is that you purchased a vehicle from Ace Dealers. So you can see your narration gives us an indication of exactly what it was that we did. In an exam, we can underline these narrations to kind of show this is the description of what the, the, the transaction is. The folio will deal with Nana, and we can see we debit and we credit that. So when you take a look at the general journal, you can see for the transaction in one place, I can see exactly what items and what accounts this is going to affect. If we post this to the general ledger, which will obviously be our next step, it's going to look like this. We'll take the vehicle account, obviously, because we bought a vehicle, and we'll debit that because it's an asset. Remember, an assets increase on the debit side and they decrease on the credit side. So our vehicle obviously is an asset and we've debited a 6,000 Rand, but you can only see half the transaction here. We do indicate that the other side of it is going to go to the bank, but to see the actual credit, we're actually going to have to go all the way to the bank account, wherever that may be. Our bank again is an asset and therefore decreases on the debit side and sorry, increases on the debit side and decreases on the credit. And you can see that we've taken 86,000 Rand out in order to buy a vehicle. When you look at this, what I want you to realize is that the debits and credits obviously are the same. The debits and credits show you the impact that this transaction has. And in the general journal, we show them together. Whereas obviously in the general ledger, we split out the debit and the credit. The other thing I want you to get from this is to start learning your referencing. When you create general journals, general ledgers, any type of journals, ledgers, trial balances in your exam, your referencing is very important. So if they say to you, create the general journal and then post to the general ledger, I want to know that you know exactly where the numbers should come from and where they should go. So what we do is we number our journals. 
the journals we then generally number by page. So these journals will be sitting on a page in the company's books and all the journals on that page, all these general journals will have the reference J1. So we always number our journals and you'll find that if you have three or four journals, all of them will be numbered J1 because that's the page number. If we take a look at the general ledgers, we number the general ledger accounts and we either use B or we use N. The B are for your balance sheet items, your N are for your income statement items or your, your statement of comprehensive income, your profit and loss. Your N stands for nominal, it doesn't really matter. Your B is going to be for all your assets, your equity and your liabilities. Your N is going to be for your income and your expenses. The way that we number them is literally as you create them. If you look at this and say, okay, the next account I need to create is stationary, then you in an exam would call stationary B3. It's as simple as that. There is no set number. There's no set referencing in terms of the numbers that these have. Bank won't always be B2. But in an exam, as you draw out the general ledger, you number them one by one. The reason we use referencing is to make sure that I can tell exactly where these numbers are coming from. So once I've numbered the general ledger, once I've numbered that account and I've put the transaction in there, I want to be able to tell where the transaction came from. So if someone was looking at the general ledger and they said, where did this transaction come from? I want them to know that they should go to page one of the general journal and go and look there. So in the folio, item or in the folio column I write J1 which was our page number. Now if you go to your general journal you'll see that the folio number there has been given as B1 which was our vehicle account in the general ledger. All we're doing is we're cross-referencing. If you were looking at the general journal alone and you wanted to trace the vehicle through to the general ledger you would know to go and look for account B1. Similarly, if you were looking at the general ledger and you wanted to trace back the item to the journal, you would know to go to page one of the journal. This would be massively important if you imagine the volume of transactions that companies deal with on a daily basis. The amount of accounts, the amount of transactions you don't want to be paging back and forth. So these referencing and the cross referencing is absolutely vital. Whenever we post anything, to the general ledger, we always cross reference. So as I take that bank amount and I take it to the bank, I say, here's my bank amount 86 and it comes from journal one, it comes from J1. And as I finish writing it in the general ledger, I come back and I write in here, I put it in B2. So this is a bit of a back and forth. You've got to get used to this referencing. So this gives us an indication of our general journal and our general ledger. And the reality is that we can use anything. Any transaction can be created and can be journalized using the general journal. So judging by this, Every sale, every single purchase, every single thing that the company does could be brought in through a general journal. And if that is the case, can you imagine again the volume of transaction? If you imagine you have an A4 page and you have these general journals on them, how many of them do you think you could fit in, right? If this is what your general journal looks like, how many of those could you get in on one page? And if you had to do this for every single sale that happened, can you imagine the volume of transactions? Can you imagine the amount of paper that we create? There's got to be a better way to do this. And the solution is to create specific journals, to create specific subsidiary journals in order to post transactions that are always happening or transactions that are regularly happening to the same place in the same way. And that way, instead of dealing with them all separately, we deal with them together. And that's where the CRJ, the cash receipt journal, the CPJ, the cash payments journal, the sales journal and the purchases journal are born. Your cash receipts journal says instead of posting every single bit of money and every single bit of cash sale that comes in one by one, all of our cash sales we're going to go and record in one journal. All of our cash payments we're going to go and record in one journal. And at the end of the month, instead of posting every single transaction, we're just going to post the totals. So the general journal gives us an introduction into the journals themselves. One, 
every single transaction could be posted or could be journalized using general journals, but we find slightly more efficient and better ways to do this using your cash receipts and your cash payments journal, your sales and your purchases journal, and we'll get into those now.